Welcome to the Dirt on the Past, a museum edition, a YouTube and podcast program of the Extreme History Project, which explores ancient and historical topics relating to artifact collections from the Museum of the Rockies right here in Bozeman, Montana. At Extreme History, we explore the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past. Because let's face it, history isn't pretty, but it's so important to know because it's the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney, and me, Crystal Alegria, as we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt, and in the archives, and in museum collections to uncover fascinating histories that are relevant to today's issues, and can help us move forward with a deeper understanding of the past. All right, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we're co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. And this week, we are at the Museum of the Rockies studio with guest Michael Fox. If you didn't tune in for our first episode, we're excited to announce that we're collaborating with the Museum of the Rockies um, here in Bozeman, Montana. And we're bringing you a new version of the podcast called The Dirt on the Past the museum edition. <laughs> These podcasts are, I know, I know. I was like, where is she? <laughs> These podcasts are going to be different in that they're, we're going to be recorded and we'll also be showcasing artifacts from the Museum of the Rockies collection. And I'm so excited today with the artifacts that we're going to get to show you. Oh, and you're going to wish you were looking through the window here at the recording studio in the dinosaur hall, because this is really cool. Um, but all of these um, audios will be on podcast wherever you can find it. And then the video version will be on the Extreme History YouTube channel and then later on Museum of the Rockies YouTube channel also. Correct. Okay, that's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So for our second museum edition episode, we're joined today by Michael Fox, who is the curator of cultural history. So welcome, Michael. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your uh, your podcasting and including us in it as well. We're you know proud to be uh, assisting you in this extremely important and fun activity. Yeah, we can't do it without you guys. Okay. So yeah, and Ashley, who's doing the recording and who also decorated this absolutely amazing studio. So it looks like a an imagined version of Darwin's office. It's super cool. So we like to start off telling all of our listeners and viewers a little bit about our guests. So, Michael, we're going to do a little intro on you. Michael Fox serves as the curator for history at Museum of the Rockies, and he specializes in culture history of the Northern Rockies region. He holds a degree in English from Cal Poly Humboldt and then a master's degree in American studies from the University of Wyoming. Michael has worked at a variety of museums, um, from the Autry Museum in the of the American West in Los Angeles to the Smithsonian Institution, the Mothership. Okay, so but he says he is most at home in the Northern Rockies, and I'm assuming that means you love your job at Museum of the Rockies, where we are right now. So well, best best job in the world. It's, yeah. it's just perfect for me. So fantastic. And Michael, you've been working with Extreme History Project for many many years sure. now on all sorts of different projects and events and all sorts of different things. And we we often ask your expertise on a, a wide array of things, but John Bozeman is one of the things that we often talk to you about. So we're glad to be here today to talk with you more about John Bozeman. Yes, we, yes, uh, Crystal and I have worked together uh, pretty extensively on John Bozeman, and it's been a great experience because I know we both learn from each other and learn from uh, other folks that we've worked with on here. So, yeah, yeah. yes, continuing work <laughs> is it's definitely great, and it is continuing work. I mean, yeah, we, there are you know, many kind of missing pieces to this story. Absolutely. And they could still turn up. They so. could, they could. So as we talk about the story, you're going to learn that there, there are quite a of pieces that we don't have the answers for. And so there is still so much more work to be done on the history of John Bozeman. But John Bozeman is kind of a myth. He's kind of a legend. And so I was really excited when we started thinking about this podcast because we do an event called History After Dark, which is 
an event that happens in October. It's kind of our one of our spooky events for Extreme History Project. And we always have people dress up as historical characters and talk to the participants in first character about their, their person. And they're often historical characters from Bozeman's past. Our town is named Bozeman. And, and so we often have John Bozeman as one of the historical characters. And this year it was actually my husband that played <laughs> nice. John Bozeman. And so, um, so while he was kind of preparing for his role as John Bozeman, he takes it very seriously. He kept asking me all these questions about John Bozeman. And, and I was like, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I know quite a bit about John Bozeman. Right. So, so um, it kind of gave me the, um, the idea of this podcast then that we could do kind of a deeper dive into into John Bozeman and so now we've brought Nancy into the the lore of John Bozeman and the myths of John Bozeman. I, I've been diving deep anywhere I could find information but also was so excited to know that this would work out so well because you actually have artifacts that are related to John Bozeman here in the collection. We do indeed. See today. Yes. Yeah so that just makes the whole thing um, a perfect uh, topic for today. For right. Sure. Right. So that's that was kind of the um, the reason that we started kind of thinking about this podcast. So I'm super excited. But John Bozeman, many of you out there have probably never heard of John Bozeman, but he is the namesake for our town that we live in, which is called Bozeman, Montana. And he has somewhat of a legendary status here in Bozeman, understandably. But he was really significant, not just to our town, but really the colonization of the West in general. He was a promoter, I'm going to say that word again, promoter, and was partially responsible for creating the Bozeman Trail, which you may have heard of that, which the Bozeman Trail was a cutoff from the Oregon Trail that brought settlers and miners to the gold fields of Virginia City, Montana. And before you go on, Ashley, could you just pull up the photo of John oh, Bozeman, just so people yeah. could get an idea of what he looked like. I'm afraid he doesn't look a whole lot like Larry in terms of <laughs> stature, maybe, and, and hairstyle, but yeah. um, but your Larry, husband did a really good he job. Did his best. Yeah. He did his best. He actually, um, you know, started to grow a mustache, didn't quite come in as full as John <laughs> Bozeman's, but we put a little bit of eyeliner and it worked. It looked <laughs> <good>. <laughs> there we go. Um, but but yeah, so that was the picture of John Bozeman. And John Bozeman is a, you know, people often refer to him as a handsome fellow. And I think in the photos, you know, he, he is very handsome. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But there are four artifacts that belong to John, that belonged to John Bozeman that are in the Museum of the Rockies collection that we're going to examine today. But before we get to those amazing artifacts, Michael, can you give us some context for John Bozeman? Tell us a little bit about how he made his way west, and how and why he came to this region that we now call Montana. Absolutely. Um, yeah, to kind, of, to kind of get a little background on uh, why Bozeman came out here, it's important to remember where he came from. He's from Pickens County, Georgia, and Pickens County is maybe 40 or 50 miles away from White County, Georgia, where in around... Uh, 1830, there was a major gold strike. A oh, really? Of, a lot of people wow. don't realize that the first gold strike in the United States was not in California. It was in Georgia. I did not know that. And um, yeah, so uh, so John Bozeman's father, William, he was, you know, in his 20s or 20s and 30s during this period. So everybody around there was you know, going gold crazy. They were like going into the mountains talking to people who had found gold, looking at the geology and what types of plants grew around in there. They, these were the first uh, real gold miners in the United States. Getting gold all. fever. and Getting uh... the gold fever. Now, the, um, the Georgia rush didn't last all that long, but the lure of gold and the idea that you could basically walk around and pick up rocks that are gold or gold ore become rich. and become Just rich nice. doing that yeah. was heavily ingrained in this part of Georgia in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, when John Bozeman was about 15, his father, William, again, got the gold fever because of the California gold rush. Got it. And you know, the, the rush really started there in 1848, 1849. 
by the early 50s, uh, William Bozeman, along with a bunch of other Georgians, decided to go by boat out to California. And unfortunately, the way that they took was not going all the way around the Horn, but was going uh, cross country across Panama. So they went down to Central America that, and then, then they were going to go on land to cross right. and then come up the other. Co- OK, exactly. But that didn't go well. It didn't go well mm. because of what Panama is all about. This is a mm. hardcore, serious jungle there. Um, and a lot of diseases that Americans would have right. no, you know, would be highly susceptible to. And we know that uh, Bozeman's group, after they had actually crossed the isthmus there, they missed their original connection for their boat and had to Ooh. wait in Panama longer yeah. until their boat, uh, the at the Clarissa Andrews showed up. Okay. And while they were on their journey back, several of them died. In oh, fact, goodness. 14 people on this passengers on this ship died. Uh we think mostly from diseases they had picked up while they were waiting around in Panama. Don't know that for sure. Um, but that is uh from everything that we currently know, uh you know, William Bozeman died on that trip. So Bozeman, when he was 15, his dad leaves. This is the second sort of gold rush that his dad's probably participated in. So John Bozeman's witnesses, and he never sees his father again after he leaves on that time, as far as we know. That is correct. Okay. Well, However, within about eight to 10 years, this 15-year-old John Bozeman uh, starts to hear about gold strikes in Colorado. Okay. He gets the gold fever himself and leaves his family uh, wife and three daughters in Georgia and heads out for the area that is now um, around Denver, the sure. area, area, which has already been somewhat colonized by other Georgians. They were, were the first coming ones. out to look for gold. They Michael, were the first we, ones who found them. Sorry to interrupt, but no, no do problem. we have any idea what he was doing for a living back in Georgia? Well, he must have gotten married pretty young, already had three daughters, because he's only now, what, like 25 or right. something. So do we know what he was doing? Uh, as far as we know, he was a farmer okay. uh, working the same land that his father had worked as a farmer as well before he got the gold fever and, and took off. Doesn't sound like farming was really their first choice. Not in really life. that okay. much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Farming strike it rich with gold right, right. <laughs> you know there's that lure. right there's right. that pull so the Bozeman went out to this uh gold rush which was right around the Denver area struck out like most mm. miners do when they come to the gold fields and within about a year or so there was a new strike that was discovered in uh what was then Idaho territory and it's now Montana territory and uh he went up to that which uh the area called Gold Creek a little area about you know west of uh west of Deer Lodge, and within a year of that, a much larger strike was found in Bannock, and all, all the miners from Gold Creek went to Bannock along with all a lot of other miners as well, some other Georgians among them, and that's where uh, Bozeman again started his, you know, trying to become a miner, and again, really struck out there, mm. but what he realized, which many of the other people, other miners and business owners realized was that the way to make serious cash here if you had struck out on gold what was called mining the miners yeah. which was like providing them the goods and services that they needed just to live yeah in this environment and those things were expensive at that time everything that they you know every kind of supply they needed had to come from salt lake Oh, and that's a long way away. And this is the thing that always amazes me because when we've, we did a project in Virginia City one time and when you look at the very earliest photographs and you look at the fact that so quickly after there's a strike, there's so many people out there, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and how quickly um, just tents and then right after that buildings with these fronts and people are supplying this huge number of people that are coming into town to live there and they're figuring out ways to haul in food, especially canned food, dry goods, or then supplying them with local, whatever they could grow or get, but then everything else you need to have a society and to build a town. So, so this is what we're realizing now is, is John Bozeman not too successful in Colorado, but is thinking, okay, I see now there's another entrepreneurial path. That's exactly right. And um, another really important part of the story is to realize how quickly these Mm. things happen. Um, 
and that's a critical part of the story as well because John Bose it's important to remember John Bozeman was only in Montana what is Montana territory for seven years mm. and all of these crazy adventures that we're talking about all happened in a very very short period of time yeah that's absolutely crazy okay so we have a sense that of of what his background was in Georgia and first comes out to Colorado um, so the next thing I, I want to ask is about the next phase that brings him up here, because we know now there are new gold strikes happening, right. especially around Bannock and then eventually um, in Virginia City, Alder Gulch and those places. Um, so John Bozeman's already been gone for a while from his family. Right. Doesn't sound like he necessarily is in a rush to return. He hasn't made his fortune. Exactly. So he's looking at other opportunities. Um, so tell us about how he got into what we think of now as Montana territory and probably through Wyoming to get there and his connection to um, what we think of as kind of a mountain man who's been out here longer, uh, John Jacobs. And um, and so what did they do? What what did Bozeman do once he got up this way? Um, again, very short period of time. Bozeman shows up in Bannock in 1862, Virginia City strike in Alder Creek, that's 1863. By the next year, uh, John Bozeman has teamed up with Jacobs and said, you know how we can make a lot of cash is if we could find a much shorter way for gold miners to get to Virginia City so they don't have to go through Wyoming and Utah and Idaho to get here. There's a much shorter way. However, uh, Bozeman, a problem, though. Bozeman needed a mountain man to try and find this. There is, however, a major problem which is this is land that has been claimed by the Oglala Lakota people. Mm -hmm. So they knew immediately that this was dangerous, that the United States government did not agree with this at all. Because there was treaties. It's place. literally breaking a treaty. So let's talk about that for a yeah. second. Um, and let's maybe um, pull up the slide that shows the Bozeman Trail. So this is really important because what you're saying is they have this idea that there's a shorter way to get to Virginia City, which yes. which is definitely the case rather than going down Salt Lake and up and around. But it takes you through what are territories that the tribes in the area, because there's more, there's a lot of them. This is under four right. areas. So it isn't just the Sioux, it's the Crow, it's Blackfeet, it's others, but it's, it's land where they can still hunt as long as there's buffalo and other game ranging on it, I think is what it says in the treaty, that as long as there's all that wild game there, those are territories that they can use and hunt. And so there is no protection and the government isn't willing to say that's not an area where people are supposed to homestead that's not an area where they're supposed to travel there's no way to guarantee their safety but they decide they're going to do it anyway. they're going to do it anyway okay and there's some you know there's some speculation about why did they think we could just you know lout this law remember it's 1864 right john bozeman is a hardcore uh georgian a confederate uh you know supporter of the Confederacy. And his opinion of the United States government at this time is probably not very high. Um, the, the government that he supports, Confederate States of America, is still at war with the United States. And so these guys are also probably thinking, who's going to come after me? They're so busy with the Civil War. Yeah. We're out here trying to make a living and find ways for Americans, Euro-Americans to come out. OK, so they see an opportunity and no one to stop them, really. We're going to risk it, is mm. what they said. What they said. And again, we don't know this for sure, but John Bozeman's you know, opinion might be Confederate States of America do not have a treaty with anybody right, right. Uh, so uh, we don't know that that was his thinking but, but surely know. some people were thinking that that totally makes sense mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. and um yeah john bezman strong sport of the confederacy we know he had at least one serious bar fight in bozeman uh where he was fighting a union sympathizer yeah. so we know he was pretty serious and there were definitely northern and southern yes. um at bannock at other places we know even miners would sometimes absolutely separate themselves northerners and southerners because the civil war was raging yeah absolutely and even even beyond that uh even after the war these were still very deeply held beliefs yeah and probably still are to some degree mm -hmm. yeah yeah. yeah yeah not so much in montana maybe but right. certainly back in georgia so right yeah right 
Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, John Bozeman's connection with John Jacobs, kind of getting back to that and what and and how they were bringing um, folks on this trail and how many times they did it and what their success was like. And just talk a little bit more about that Bozeman Trail aspect of his life. Yeah, the Bozeman Trail was, you know, the, it was something that these guys basically invented. We know that there were a lot of, uh, you know, indigenous and native trails that went through this area and they probably followed those pretty closely. Yeah. Um, but their first trip on, on what would become the Bozeman Trail was fairly epic. Uh, that you know, they were traveling with uh, Jacobs's young daughter. Okay. On this. Yikes. Um, but I, you know, my impression is that there were a number of people in Virginia City who knew this was going to happen, yeah. and because of kind of John Bozeman's reputation as kind of adventurer and promoter, they thought that although this was highly dangerous, uh, that there were two people who could probably pull this off. It was these two guys. Okay, let's pull the um, slide up again. So the Bozeman Trail, as we think of it now, it splits off. Is it as far east as, is that Casper, Wyoming? Is that where we think of it? Or farther east, does it split off from what would have been the regular Oregon Trail? Um, this is, the. I mean, this is splitting off from the Oregon Trail. Um, at this time, uh, really the, the main place that this, uh, you know, division came where uh, the Bozeman Trail begins is actually at Fort Laramie, which is kind of, uh, southeast of where Casper is now. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, Fort Laramie was where this where this started, and it's it's an interesting jumping off point because this is in fact a you know a Union operated fort, and these guys come up and say, hey, you should try our new trail that's shorter, oh. and so the soldiers are like, yeah, but it goes directly through hunting grounds that are guaranteed by the first Fort Laramie treaty and that been right would have been signed right yeah. there and it's interesting yeah. because you can see I mean that trail the Oregon Trail must have gone quite south because look at all the mountains that are there south of where the Bozeman Trail is so to get around to Virginia City would have been incredibly difficult and time consuming I think yes. they said it cut 400 miles off yes which is huge is. a lot of days a lot many, of days many, many yes, days. yes. Yeah. weeks imagine weeks. you yeah. are in a wagon being pulled mm. by oxen I mean, 400 miles. No, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Oof. God. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it was, you know, it was very enticing for folks, but anyway. And ex exactly. And yeah. Bozeman, uh, you know, Bozeman and Jacobs, they brought the first, you know, colonizers in through this area um, on, on the way down there. In fact, Bozeman and Jacobs and daughter were attacked. They were captured for a while. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I can't remember whether Cheyenne or Lakota who had captured them, but eventually they escaped and continued on their route down to pick up uh, travelers on the Oregon Trail and convince them to come back on the same trail. So very adventurous, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And um, yeah, Bozeman uh, brought, gosh, I can't even remember. It, it was a number, a pretty large number yeah. of yeah. people on this trail. Basically... Uh, uh completing the idea that he had left with the people back in Bozeman that he was going to bring people into this area who hadn't had uh you know any supplies since Fort Laramie right he made good on that promise it was not without injury however and they you know the wagon trains of Bozeman brought through they were you know fairly regularly attacked uh people were killed on this trail and there were, you know, while Bozeman is going back and forth between uh, Fort Laramie and what would become Bozeman, there were others who actually took the trails themselves. Mm -hmm. Army strongly discouraged this, and there were some people who never made it out of Wyoming territory even before they were summarily killed. And the idea was that you had to have a large wagon train in order to fight off whatever Native people were going to. Yeah, there. there's some sad stories of um, a father and his son and a few sm much smaller parties not making it and, yeah. and getting killed and scalped. and yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, they're trespassers. They, they, and they Absolutely. Trespassers. In this area. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I also think about this as, you know, John Bozeman being this very young man. Mm -hmm. and, and so he's really, and he hasn't been out here for very long. Only a few he, years. He doesn't know what he's doing, you know, I, I think. 
I think John Jacobs really did know what he was doing. Yes. And so, so I always think about, you know, that we call this the Bozeman trail and, mm -hmm. and it's really, you know, John Bozeman who gets the glory, but I kind of see him as a little bit of a kind of fumbling his way along. He gets lost at times during right. this trail. Right. He's you hear he then around. has to try to hook up with a, <laughs> with a Jim Bridger trail. So yeah. set yeah. to context yeah. between Jacobs and Bridger. Now, now Bridger, was out here for Bridger, a yeah. long, long time and had, had had native wives, I think more than one and yes. children. Yeah. And so, but he had a good relationship with, with most of the tribes. He wasn't doing a lot to, it seemed like upset them or trespass them. And he had obviously married in and built relationships and he had ways of getting around. He was kind of known, but then yeah, Bozeman comes along. He's this young guy yeah. and Bridger actually goes below all those mountains of a more southerly route mm -hmm. that would meet up with where um Bozeman was. So so talk a little bit about yeah, Bozeman in comparison to these kind of mountain men, the more classic mountain. Yeah, men. Bozeman was a total newcomer. Remember, he'd only been when he started this trail, he'd only been in the West for mm -hmm. four years. Mm -hmm. And Jim, some in Colorado. Jim yeah. Bridger had been here for decades by that time. He was a well-known guide on the trail. He, you know, was a guy for the U.S. government and was extremely influential with uh, treaty making and politics through with the indigenous peoples. In fact, Bridger uh, was one of the co-authors uh, of the original map of the Fort Laramie Treaty. That's right. So That's right. he, you know, he was there when this treaty was drawn up and he said, do not go through these lands because you will definitely be attacked. They know you know, where this line approximately is. Um, and he said, if you want to get to Virginia City faster, go on my route, which bypassed all of that land. He didn't get there as fast as Bozeman on that one particular summer, but much more safely and yeah, politically uh, correct. But then yes. tell us what happens with then, though there is this violence, there are more and more people coming out, a lot of them taking the route that, that Bozeman really kind of talks about and popularizes. And tell us what then the government starts doing with these, with the army and these forts. Um, yes, eventually the army says, well, we, there are so many people going on this route now. Um, we need to, you know, we need to protect them. And it wasn't like the army just decided this. People in Montana territory were screaming for the U.S. military to come in and protect them. Um, and which is uh, ironic considering that the government had been a signatory of the Fort Laramie Treaty, who specifically said, we are not going to build roads or forts yeah. on this land. So the army goes and builds a series of forts. Um, and in pretty way, small forts, but they were forts. Yeah. yeah. And in a way, I think they were building them for protection, but they were also building them to try to keep the settlers from in the miners to discourage from them. coming through, to discourage them, to hold them back. They weren't super successful in that, but I think that's what they were, the government was sending them out there to do at this time. So. Absolutely. So forts like uh, Fort Phil Kearney, which uh, is in, you know, it's in Wyoming, and this is really the beginning of the serious part of the, of the Bozeman Trail. Prior to that, uh, there was another small fort there, but Fort Phil Kearney was really kind of the main one where they strongly discourage people from going on that. In fact, during Nelson Story's, you know, epic cattle drive, yes. he went Jeez. basically on this trail and the government said, no, you cannot do this. And, uh, and he Storm, had all the cattle that he was driving. He's got all the cattle and he like outsmarted the government. He just like went around them. Um, in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. <laughs> and this is 1866. So yeah, that's, it's years. only two years after this trail was blazed. Right. But yeah. For Phil Kearney, they said, you are, you cannot do this. You are breaking a treaty. You're not allowed to do it. Yeah. But they still had the forts there. And uh, yeah, the next one on the trail is Fort C.F. Smith, uh, which is you know, in current day uh, Montana. And then after that, there was no fort of any type until you got to yeah. Bozeman. And, and it sounds like, you know, all the tribes knew what this meant, knew what they knew as soon as they saw people coming through yeah. that this looked like they were going to lose territory, lose rights. And so there was there was violence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But they they knew what it meant in the long run. 
They absolutely Especially do. once the forts got built. Well, yeah, yeah once the wagon trains are going mm -hmm. through there, they can mm -hmm. say, everybody coming through here are colonizers. Mm -hmm. They're trying to colonize our territory, which means we will lose it. The other yeah. thing to remember is that these lands have been set aside specifically for hunting. And when you have large wagon trains going through there, yeah, that's going to, A, just scare off game in general, but these guys are going to be hunting like yes. crazy. They're depleting, and, and depleting the game. Yeah. Depleting the grass. Yeah. Exactly. The and the they're, the eating, yeah, they're eating yeah. all the grass. Yeah. And, you know, their horses eat the grass that the bison were. Bison yeah. aren't going to go to a place full of that grass. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a huge impact on their hunting grounds. And yeah. I think the way it was written in the treaty, um, it wasn't honors as, as it should have been, but clearly it led to eventually seeding away those lands because oh. the game was so depleted yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. okay so Go let's ahead, move, move on. let's yeah. move on a little bit so um so you know that's this is how john bozeman kind of gets some fame is through this trail and his in his success it wasn't um a large number of times that he was successful in bringing people um but then he's and then he started moving into other areas because they kind of, the government then was successful in kind of shutting some of this down. Right. And so, um, so he had to make other, uh, he had to find other ways to make a living. And so he was talking to um, a couple men, a couple men who lived in Gallatin city, but he met these two gentlemen in Virginia city, Daniel Rouse and William Beal. And maybe, Michael, you can kind of talk about that meeting and the significance that came from the meeting of these three minds. Right. These three guys were definitely an interesting group. As you mentioned before, Bozeman was a real promoter, and he did promotion on his trail. But in this uh, particular instance, he met up with uh, Beal and Rouse, who were uh, basically trying to be farmers. They were being successful farmers at Gallatin City, which is the site of which is currently very close to current um, Three Forks, right, where the, uh, you know, the headwaters of the Missouri are. And they were going, they made their way to Virginia City uh, to pick up supplies or bring their crops in. We're not too sure. We know this meeting happened in spring, so it's most likely they were going to Virginia City for supplies. But while there, they met up with John Bozeman, expert promoter, who mentioned to them this spot, this wonderful spot that was right uh, directly at the mouth of, uh, of a major canyon, that his trail was going to come right down. And uh, he said, if you if some entrepreneur, some uh, forward thinking folks thought about building a town there, it would be a great spot to um, to, to uh, meet up with these, uh, you know, people who are on their way to Virginia City. And I actually got a great quote from that. Um, he told them uh, about a spot standing right in the gate of the mountains, ready to swallow up all the tender feet with their golden fleeces to be taken care of. <laughs> so this was perfect. He was definitely yeah. promoting this as a yeah. place where you could make money selling supplies to people on their ways to on their way to the mines well both um you know veal and rouse they are they're already farmers out in uh, gallatin and they come over and look at this spot and say this is pretty major in terms of agriculture and what they saw was what would become one of the richest agricultural areas in montana territory and they immediately uh set up homesteads for themselves as well as one for john bozeman and began laying out a town site. Uh, within just a couple of years, uh, there was a small population here. We had hotels. Most of the people were living in log cabins. But uh, town of Bozeman probably boasted 75, 100 people here, yeah. which as a town was kind of big in those days. But as you can imagine, a town like that, everybody knows everybody and knows everybody's business. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, Bozeman, Rouse, and Beal were right in the middle of this. Again, all being all, all promoting. <laughs>
we don't really know why they named the town of Bozeman after John Bozeman, but we think that, you know, John Bozeman had quite a personality. He was a good dresser. He didn't... Right? Oh, okay. Was... They actually selected yeah. the, all right, because he had other jobs as a recorder yeah. and he drove mail to Virginia City at times, you've told yeah. me. So yeah. he had lots of different ways of making money and involved. But yeah, you so think that William Alderson put his name out and said we should tell, they were thinking about calling this town Farmington because it was a farming oh, community. Sure. And William Alderson kind of threw it out there, another one of our town founders, he said, I think we should call this this place Bozeman City. And everyone agreed, I guess. And so, but I think he was very charismatic. I think he had a good sense of humor. He was a young man. I think he was kind of daring and adventurous, you know, as we've seen from everything that we've talked about so far. So, so they went along with it and, and the town became known as Bozeman City. Now, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> what? Meanwhile, I mean, yeah. he's left them now. Yeah. It's it's how many years now we're into this? I feel like it's yeah. coming up on like four, five, six. So now. we're in 1864 right now is where we're at. Right. So he's been gone for a few years. Yeah, like maybe five years. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe four years. Four and years, yeah. we know that he was uh, sending letters back home, back to his mother. And in our collection, we have two of those. Oh, yeah. we'll see um, one in a little bit. That yeah. We'll take a look at take a look at those. But yeah. he was at uh, you know, basically reporting back on what he was doing. And this was not unusual. I mean, no. no one really brought their families out here at this time. There was a few families that were coming, but most of the time men would just come on their own because this was not a place for women and children. You know, this was, you know, the wilderness is what they would call it. But um, most women and children probably didn't want to come out here, you know, at this point in time. But once the town got established, you mm -hmm. know, there could have been a possibility mm -hmm. of sending for them because by then some people mm -hmm. did. So yeah. And they were. It was still very Pretty rustic <laughs> here. And um, yeah, we don't really know how much effort Bozeman put into building a house for himself or building a place for his wife and children to come to. And as Crystal was saying, um, most of the men who came out here uh, didn't actually plan on even staying. Mm -hmm. They were going to stay. They were going to be there. They were going to extract the gold and then go back. Okay. And this is the story of basically all these gold rushes from Georgia to California to Colorado to here. Men weren't coming out here to like build towns. They were here to get the cash and get out. Bozeman was becoming somewhat different than that, though, because people recognized the richness of the um, of the farming going on here. Why did Bozeman not become a farmer instead of continuing to be this nutty adventurer, entrepreneur? We don't really know the he answer. He had a little farm. He did have right, a little farm that he farmed. I, I don't know how you know de dedicated he was to that. <laughs> I think he liked I know they, uh, they, uh, they uh, talk uh, about John Bozeman <laughs> that he liked to sit in a saloon and play cards. Yeah, so there, yeah. there is that too. It but... is interesting because we don't have like the Bozeman House residence. Yeah. We don't have like yeah. places like that associated with him, but we associate yeah. him with downtown because I mean our main street runs right through, and then you'd be out on the highway which comes through that pass that would have been where he would have been leading people, and it opens into this mm -hmm. whole Gallatin Valley area. So it seems like a, a a great, and they made it wide enough. We always know and see those pictures for wagon trains to come in mm -hmm. and be able to turn all the way around. So our right. main street has always been really wide. So now, but he meets these other guys, you say, and they do decide to actually make a town mm -hmm. and make a place where people will stay. So you could mine the miners, but it seems like they also started to realize other people are now going to come to farm yeah. and other and come to start business. And that would be supplying the miners with food. So they were they were um, planting crops that they can then sell to the miners. And so that was part of the plan as well. So now going yeah. forward from yeah. 1864. So so, you know, let's talk a little bit about John Bozeman and his businesses, you know, because you we, we've talked about how he's this promoter. And he and of course, everybody here had to make they had to do a lot of different things to make a living. As we still do it in both as we still do it. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, he would he was like you said, carry he would carry the mail to Virginia City and back, and he'd charge they say fifty cents a piece of of mail, which is quite a bit of money, but um, that's what they say it, he charged. He was in the hotel business with another couple called George and Elmira Frazier. And so they built together with John Bozeman, a hotel on Main Street. Um, he was also in the Mackinac business. The Mackinaws were these flat boats that would go up and down the Yellowstone. He was invested in that to a certain degree. He was also invested in a 
bridge over the Yellowstone and in, in a ferry business over the Yellowstone. So he had it, you know, he was in a lot of different things, but he was also trying to get into contracting. And I think that's kind of, this is, this is the, the trail that led to his demise. And so mm, maybe contracting. We, yeah, okay, maybe we can kind of move forward to talk a little bit about um, a, the tragedy that struck John Bozeman in 1867. And so I'll let you tell the story, Michael. Yes, um, this is this is really part of what became the legend of John Bozeman, part of the great mystery of John Bozeman, and probably the thing that John Bozeman is best known for is his death. Right, um, right. And what was what was going on here was another entrepreneurial uh, adventure that Bozeman was going on um, with a guy named Tom Cooper, who was a partner in a flour mill uh, in Bozeman. And their idea was to go to Port C.F. Smith, which is, again, that's, you know, way up the Yellowstone uh, or way down the Yellowstone from Bozeman and uh, try to get the government to purchase flour from the Coober, the, the Coober Mill. And they made it, I would say, maybe a third of the way. And something happened. Um, essentially, uh, Bozeman was killed. We know this part for sure. And um, his partner, Tom Cooper, uh, returned without his horses, I believe. Um, back, he basically walked all the way back to the place where, essentially, where um, Livingston, Montana is today. That was a place where they launched and brought back uh, Mackinac's um, and other boating things. And um, yes, so Tom Cooper stumbles into this ranch there. The story and ranch. The story ranch, yeah. Nelson, story ranch, and tells his story of how he and Bozeman had been attacked by, they thought were renegade Blackfeet Indians who killed Bozeman and shot Cooper through the shoulder. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that report and the guy who reported it. Well, um, Thomas, so Thomas Cooper came back and he told this story about- To the, William McKenzie, right? Is that the yeah, first person? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Who's a good friend of John. Right, so, so kind of just to back up a little bit, because we want to talk a little bit more about William McKenzie. So um, John Bozeman, Thomas Cooper, and William McKenzie had come from Bozeman on that first night. So the first night they were coming from Bozeman and they stayed at the Story Ranch in what is in Paradise Valley, where the, mm -hmm. the ranch still exists and the Story family still runs it today. But they stayed at this ranch the first night and William McKenzie was with them. It was the three of them. And William McKenzie was supposed to go on this trip to the flour mill with them. But William McKenzie decided he was um, not feeling well and he stayed back at the ranch. And so then it was just John Bozeman and Thomas Cover who went out the next day. And they got to um, their special spot for lunch that they were going to sit down and have some lunch dinner they called it and they sat down right along the Yellowstone River and as they were starting to kind of pull out their lunch over the horizon they see a group of indigenous folks kind of coming over the the, the hill and John Bozeman thought they were crow and so he kind of called them in because he was friendly with the crow as were most folks in Bozeman and so they started to come in and then he realized they were a black feet and the Blackfeet um, were not as friendly. And so Thomas Cover and John Bozeman both got very nervous. Um, before the end of lunch, shooting had occurred. As you said, John Bozeman was killed, dead on the spot right away. Um, and Thomas Cover got away with a shoulder wound, went to the Story Ranch, told his story, then came back to Bozeman and told his story some more. And so at that point, he told William McKenzie when he was at the ranch. So, okay. Absolutely. So this was, uh, yes, this was a, there was a huge hue and cry about this. The, you know, the town, the, the you know, patriarch of the town had been killed yeah. by Indians. And, uh, you know, the, the story was that, oh, these had been like renegade black bees. Mm -hmm. Well, the term renegade is one that uh, Euro-Americans basically invented in order to say these 
people were, you know, had different ideas and different beliefs than the main body of the, the Black people. Mm -hmm. This was not unusual. You know, it's uh, these tribes were not uh, this kind of monolithic thing where you've got like one boss and everybody answers to him. Um, the, you know, people it certainly had their own ideas. They could go out on their own. That's what these people were allegedly doing right so the story is that they were a small group of blackfeet traveling on foot going to live with a band of crow because they had been um ostracized because one of them had killed um another blackfeet man right. a chief and so that they were they were then on the run and they thought that they would be able to come down this way and join a band join of, of crow. crow and find some protection and live there that's the story that's told much later that shows up in the newspaper but let's shows, just yeah shows up in the newspaper just a month or so maybe not even a month or so after the fact but yeah right but yeah. then again later it yeah. gets retold and retold yeah. Yeah. but talk a little bit about some of the strange aspects discrepancies and questions mm -hmm. that have come up both by Mackenzie and by others who have since thought through this scenario and the likelihood that you would have some some indigenous Blackfeet coming up um, on foot and and leaving behind mm -hmm. so many things that were left behind. Right. On the site. So go ahead, Crystal. Right. So there's so right immediately after Thomas Coover came back to Bozeman, people started questioning his story because um, the the shoulder wound that was on that he had had powder burns close to the wound on his shirt, and so that indicates um he was shot at close range and you know that probably wouldn't have been the case if they were trying to kind of flee from these black feet it probably would have been a far a shooting from farther away so some people say that maybe it was tom cobert that killed john bozeman um and he kind of did a his own you know self-inflicted shot to show that you know he had been shot too. It was obviously the the indigenous people who were who had killed John Bozeman. So so there's 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 a few theories here. The first theory, of course, that we've talked about is that the Black Beat killed John Bozeman. The second theory is that Thomas Cover killed John Bozeman, and that um, he invented the Black Beat story to cover it right, up. Okay. Right, and there is. Some people have said that, you know, maybe that's because Thomas Cover's wife, Mary, was having an affair with John Bozeman. But there is evidence that Mary wasn't even in Bozeman prior to um, to this happening, that she actually came. There's there's a newspaper article that has her coming um, to Bozeman after John Bozeman was dead. So so that theory's kind of fallen apart a little bit. But there could have been other reasons why Thomas Cover wanted to kill John Bozeman. Um, and then the third theory is that um, someone else killed John Bozeman, someone like Nelson's story. And and people have said that maybe that was because John Bozeman was starting to kind of infringe on some of the story's business. Also, Nelson's story was from the north and John Bozeman was from the south. And there, like we said Could before, there was some a lot of these conflicts. So yeah. so those are the three most current theories. And um there's what, what there are some be... of the reasons to doubt the story about the black feet? Because because I'll just say one thing and then I'll, I'll let right you ahead. go, Michael. But we have, and we're gonna show you here in just a minute, we have John Bozeman's firearm. And so when the um black feet came and killed John Bozeman, they left without taking his firearm. A firearm is one thing that the native people were wanting, and they would have, they would have definitely taken that gun if they killed John Bozeman. They would not have left that gun on his body. Um, so that's one thing. And so now I'll pass it back to you, Michael, on some of well, the other discrepancies in the case. Yes, yeah. and um, when uh, another thing that happened was uh, there was a story. Uh, that uh, Nelson's story actually sent one of his men out to the site of this death to investigate uh, what this area looked like. Right. And um, that guy went out there, looked at it and said, there are no tracks from anybody else there. The only tracks we could find are Bozeman and Coover's uh, horses. And that's it. They, they said there's no evidence that anybody else was there. And they were shod horses that were exactly yeah. these were shod horses. So they, you know, it they, would have been definitely Cover and Bozeman's horses. Um, yeah. Almost certainly. Yeah. Uh, 
so we've got that the guess the physical evidence that was there but the the guy that story sent out there said there was no evidence of any kind of a scuffle or anything there at the ground not disturbed nothing like that um which would have been extremely unusual particularly because of Cooper's story where he mm -hmm. said there was a scuffle and uh you know these uh, blackfeet shot us well as, as crystal had mentioned uh if there had been something like that in order for Cooper to have that very distinctive powder burn that had that shot had to be fired from you know probably less than five to ten feet away and had that been the case there would have been a, a major scuffle going on there also if you were shot at that close of a range it seems unlikely that they would miss um so <laughs> they, there are all, yeah there are discrepancies there kind of all over the place there's also to me the the part about so much that's left behind with John Bozeman's body. So first of all, there's no scalping um, nope. of the body, which was still happening on Bozeman Trail and things. So it wasn't like we were past that time period. Secondly, there was money and his gold pocket watch, not to mention his revolver and probably ammunition. So everything except the horses. And Coover had claimed that they wanted the horses and they said, we want to steal your horses and take them and then shot, but then everything else was left behind. And it seems so unlikely that these folks who might've been desperate and on the run wouldn't have taken other things of value, you know, in, in order to help them on their way. So that seems very suspect aside from all the physical evidence and, and the powder burn even on Coover, right? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes. So we don't really know what the story is, but um let's do one thing first okay. let's take a look at the painting that yeah. shows an imagined version and this and and i want you um michael to tell us about the painting because it's here in the collection this is an image of the painting tell us who did it when they did it and then let's talk about what we're seeing in that image so this uh this is a an image of a painting called um, death of john bozeman and it was done by edgar paxton uh late 1890s 1898 and um it is very much an imagined uh version of this um that william mckenzie the mm -hmm. guy who was left behind at the story ranch and a very very close uh, associate of Bozeman, he looked at this and said, every single thing about it is wrong. <laughs> said Bozeman was not dressed like that. He was dressed in basically a business suit, which is what he usually wore. Um, no buckskins, no fringe, na, na, and na. and um, no facial hair. He never apparently he, had a beard. No, he never had a, never wore a beard. Um, the rifle he is carrying is definitely wrong as well. Um, we know that um, that really, if you look at this image from the evidence of Tom Cooper, who is in the red on the, you know, on the far left there, he's got this giant powder burn. And the guy who is uh, the, these folks on the horses, uh, if they had shot Cooper from there, he would definitely not have a powder burn on him. Right. The other thing is even the background is totally wrong. That is yeah. not at all what the, the, the site looked found. like. Yeah. And Crystal and I have actually been to this site. We have. No yeah. pine trees or no giant mountains around it. Um, it didn't look like this at all. So um and then also the the Indians pictured were not mounted. There was nothing in the story about them being on. They were maybe they were walking with one pony but the whole point was that they didn't have horses and they wanted them so that part of the photo is also incorrect it, it that's true yeah. you, what you see here are what do you got five horses here and according to Tom right. Cooper the only two that were here were the two that uh he's standing right next to John Bozeman and and Cooper's as well so this painting though I'm sure many have seen and it and it's it's something to look at. It's very mm -hmm. evocative and it plays into all these myths and stories mm -hmm. we have about the West and cowboys and Indians and, and these buckskins and all of this stuff. And yet what we've been told by people who were there at the time and who saw this painting later is that none of this is, is accurate. And I love this. I love that we brought this painting in because I think you're right, Nancy, it really does speak to this idea of the myth of the West, the myth of this, you know, and, and 
like Michael, you said this landscape even is the landscape is exactly. you know, such this, a good point this landscape yeah. looks rugged it dramatic, looks dramatic yeah. the yes. snow-capped peaks the you know all that yeah whereas you know the yellowstone valley is kind of there there are peaks in the distance but um they are not quite this rugged and the the landscape is more rolling hills and it's a you know a riverbed valley and it's, it's beautiful but it is not this rugged landscape, this this wilderness, you know, that people are drawn to. And so, you know, this is this is also promotion. And I think John Bozeman was a promoter. John Bozeman probably would have gone. He would have been would like, have great. <laughs> when he portrayed at this time, and this is very romantic, but it's into just these ideas we yeah. have, what we're starting to see in films that start to come out, but yes. what has already been being portrayed in literature. And kind of thinking about, tall you know, tales. people yeah. coming to Montana then, like in 18, the 1860s, when John Bozeman is trying to get people out here, he was probably speaking of this place in very similar terms to how people today um, think of Montana. And the reason people are moving to Montana today is because of this myth of the West. And so, um, and and this is in my mind because I just went to a presentation last night by Betsy Gaines Quammen, and she just has a new book out called True West. And we, and she was talking a lot about this last night, these myths of the West. And so um, I think this painting is just, you know, encapsulates that so beautifully. So I'm glad we brought that in. Absolutely. So, and another yeah. thing that people may not know about Edgar Paxton is some of his paintings are in the state capitol in Helena. He mm -hmm. worked out of Helena. But at the same time he was working on Death of John Bozeman, he was working on another painting, which was which is a gigantic image wow. of uh, the Battle of the Little Big Horn. Oh, very this famous. Custer's yeah, last Custer's stand. Last stand. Yeah. And this is at uh, mm -hmm. Buffalo Bill historical center over in Cody and it is massive it's got to be 20 by 30 I mean it is gigantic wow and interesting the story about Paxton was that he did extensive research on uh on the battle and you can see there are details you know scattered throughout that uh were things that uh veterans of the battle had told him about mm -hmm. or things that other soldiers had mentioned to him as well so at the time it was considered to be the quintessential image of the Custer fight mm -hmm. we know now however that it was not quite like that at all exactly. um so another so it hasn't uh, held up again he was told yeah. stories but if he's doing this at the same time I imagine that explains some of almost the, the, the sort of tragic heroic figure of this white man in buckskins dying, you know, in battle, trying to tame the West or something. Exactly. And you will notice who in the Custer painting is also wearing buckskins. Mm -hmm. George Custer, who we know was not wearing buckskins on that day. Okay, so so the buckskins are definitely a thing with Pat. Is that a Wild Bill Hickok? It, it's... um. No, who's who had the show, the traveling show? Oh, Buffalo Bill. Buffalo yeah. Bill's this traveling is, show. That is that who popularized the buckskins, and then it shows up retroactively in yes. in, in images <laughs> of periods where nobody was actually wearing buckskins. And he, you know, some people hate it when I mention Buffalo Bill's Wild West, but that is where so many of mm. the, our traditional images and traditional ideas yes. about cowboys and about the settlement or the uh, conquest of the West come from. Yes. It's directly out of that show. Before Buffalo Bill, uh, people totally looked down on cowboys. They were not like the Knights of the Plains. These were dirty, filthy people you didn't want to talk to. Right. Um, it's Buffalo Bill who created this image of the mm -hmm. cowboy, these images of the mountain man. Um, and, so interesting. And, and that is exactly what you see in Hollywood movies from the very beginning. Yep. They're copying things directly out of Buffalo, Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill. And he was wildly popular, toured all through Europe, not just the United States. Absolutely. So that idea spread far and wide. So let's go back to the image quickly. And while we look yeah. at that image again, could you get some of the artifacts we have to show you um, that are associated with John Bozeman from Museum of the Rockies collection. Yeah. So what we're doing right now is we're going to have our overhead cam on in just a minute. And Michael Fox, who is um, the curator for the history collection, is going to be showing us some of the artifacts they have here that we know are associated with John Bozeman. And this is yeah. so fabulously exciting. 
Um, I, oh, and maybe we'll zoom out a little yeah. bit too. Okay. And we could zoom in on one at a time. So Ashley's going to get us all sorted here. Oh my gosh. This is so cool. Yeah. Holy moly. And I don't have gloves on, so I'm not going to touch yeah, so, anything. So Michael's just going to, so we're going to let Michael kind of breathe the dust in of all yes. this amazing <laughs> stuff. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And here's, okay. Is this it or is there more? This is it. Okay, the, perfect. The letters. There's the yeah. letter. Yeah. Okay. So, well, let's do these first, and then we'll do the yeah. letters after. So people so can where see do the we handwriting. Start with? Should we start with the the revolver since we've talked about that already? Michael, do you want to come out and talk up close to the microphone so we can? Um, I'll put the hear microphone. Right here. I'll put this one near Michael. There okay. you go. Okay. Do you want to be on that side or this side? Oh, I can. I can okay. Perfect. Okay. Yep. There we go. This and here. This over here. There we go. Okay. This. All right. Tell us what we're looking at. Okay, so these are items that were found on Joe's, John Bozeman's body. Uh, when his body was eventually that discovered. is crazy. I'm looking at Ashley mouth. Wow, over there, and that's exactly how I feel too. I'm like, this is nuts. So nuts. So on his body. So <laughs> however he died, we know he died with these things. Yes. These are yes. from the site. So how did they get back to Bozeman? Do you know any of this? I don't want to put you on the spot, Michael. But how did they get back to Bozeman, and then how did they end up here? The story uh, is a little vague, but. Uh, Probably the best version of this that I'm aware of is that his longtime partner, uh, Willie McKenzie, took these off of the body and brought them back to Bozeman. Um, what we're looking at here is John Bozeman's Colt's revolver. Uh, this, I believe, is a model 1851 Army. Um, and so he had, he almost, he may have brought this with him from. Georgia, he may have purchased it somewhere in the West. We don't know the exact history on it. This is the powder horn that uh, he used with it. That's a beautiful horn. So is that a bison horn? No, it's a cow horn. Cow horn, and okay. These were, you know, these were popular in the East as well as in the West. Um, but it's important to note that this revolver is a uh, cap and ball revolver. It does not take cartridges. Okay, okay. so that's why you need So the... every shot you take, you need to refill the barrel with uh, powder uh, and a ball. So this so is a that's ball a lot of shot. time to get yourself sorted. Yeah, and then you got to hope that it actually works when you pull the trigger too. Yeah. That so is correct. Okay. Very important. So you had to load the cylinder and put little explosive caps on this okay. every time you pull the. Not automatic yeah. by any means yeah. uh every shot you take you've got to pull the hammer back again okay so um that is i mean that that this is the weapon that he was carrying he was mm -hmm. carrying it in uh this leather holster wow. and it's a little oh, hard to see goodness look at that and so would that maybe have been on his belt or something it looks like there's absolutely a there. that would have been on the belt wow and it's a little hard to see here but you can barely see right here what's that you can see this is the john bozeman brand oh i see it it's, Although, right, it's right there let me see you have to come oh okay yeah you can, yeah right. you just point to it oh, right there, there right there okay yeah. and it looks like an inverted triangle b and uh, i have looked for this in the earliest uh, montana brand books that i could wow, find that's not really recorded interesting. That's really, really interesting. and that's not uh that's not too crazy i mean he died in 1867 yeah, right, right, the right. idea of even having a brand book uh would, would have been a new thing because there weren't that many ranchers but so we know that this and so these were probably recovered from the body is there anything on the powder horn that has his brand or his name or anything else nothing okay. recorded on that okay. all right the other important thing is this pocket watch oh goodness oh, the and pocket watch that looks awesome it's really an important piece and there are a couple reasons why one is that a watch uh was in fact mentioned in uh his discussions with uh his partner's wife 
in the hotel business. Elmira, Supposed, Elmira Frazier. Okay. Supposedly, uh, he said he that he wanted her to keep his gold pocket watch that, to be sent back to his mother in case he didn't return from the sport to C.F. Smith. Oh, so his he, mother, not his wife. Let's just be clear on that. Yes, okay. his mother, not <laughs> yes. his wife. Yeah. All right. Um, wow. And uh, so there was some premonition. I that wonder. He was Absolutely. maybe worried about this trip for whatever reason. You know, maybe he knew there was someone out to get him. And, yeah. And um, so. Anyway, and his was... his pal, uh, William McKenzie, he had told McKenzie that he really had serious trepidations about this trip. Yeah, and maybe William McKenzie was like, you know, I'm going to sit this one I out. I might sit this one out, yeah. <laughs> but it's a little worrisome. Can, you, can so. you show us what it looks like, maybe also closed, if there's anything we can zoom in on, just to see what the detail would have looked like? And this is a pretty important detail on this, and I'm not sure if you can see it exactly. Maybe and even... Do we want to move the gun yeah. and then, or, or okay, yeah, yeah, whatever is easier. Okay, that's okay. it, because you're going to want to see this. Okay. There we go. Maybe now you cannot the other way well, like that'd be a good idea. oh goodness now What's what you that? can see on here is a little hard to see maybe kind of there you go there, there you, you go. go there you go there you go but that is an engraved image and everybody i have talked to regarding this has immediately said that's robert e lee Whoa, you just blew my mind. <laughs> I did not know. I see it. And that and really you can see. And that really supports this idea that, you know, John Bozeman was a, a staunch um, Confederate. Yeah. Wow. And so I wonder if there were other people. Do we know anything about were there other watches that had this engraving and you know is it something you could buy or did he steal it from robert no, 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 no. but i'm just wondering like was that something people did who were really loyal i mean that must have been incredibly special maybe it was his dad's maybe that's why he wanted to go back to his mom you know and thinking about maybe he picked this up you know during the war like in 1863 1864 maybe he picked this up as the war was progressing and robert e lee was really becoming such a central figure too you know thinking about that and these watches do you ask how commercially available they were they were widely commercially available wow. in the south wow. um and yes this was was something that would definitely have been available in the south and available out here in the west because there were so many southerners coming out here as well okay. um it, he would have had to have picked it up after 1861 by which time he was in colorado he couldn't have picked it up out here as well. Yeah. So we don't think they were made before 1861. Not the uh, not the watch. Okay, that's incredible. Okay, so he must have found it, and that must have been important to him still. So that's a really good point, Crystal. Wow, that is absolutely fascinating. Do we know again? You said William McKenzie may have retrieved these. And yeah, and I, and I want to just say too, when John Bozeman died. Um, you know, Cover came back to Bozeman and told the town about this. And so they sent a party, including Daniel Rouse and um, a few other folks over to retrieve the body to bring it back. And they went over to the um, this location, which it was about 10 miles east of Livingston, where Livingston is today. Livingston, of course, didn't exist. And it was April. And so they couldn't get the body back on a wagon because the mud was so bad they couldn't mm -hmm. take a wagon over and get the body back. So they buried the body where he died. And so I I, I think maybe at that time they brought all these. I'm sure that's back. right. I'm yeah, sure you're correct. Yeah, there. yeah. So, but, and then they left the body there for um, three, four years. What did we decide? Yeah, it was, it was 1870, 1870 that he then was yeah. brought back and they buried him in Sunset Hill Cemetery. And it was a quite a while later before Nelson's story was able to put the big monument yeah. up there, th something like 1890. I think you so, have. Yeah, I let's think, have a, we have an image have of an that image as of well. That, just to show that real quick. Um, and there's an inscription on there too. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So so the marble shaft, I'll just read this, purchased by Nelson's story to be erected over John Bozeman's grave arrived last week and will be set up immediately. It reads as follows. In memory of John Bozeman, age 32 years, killed 
killed by Blackfeet Indians on the Yellowstone, April 18, 1867. He was a native of Georgia, was one of the first settlers of Bozeman and from whom the town takes its name. So Nelson's story paid for this monument and John Bozeman was buried on Nelson's story's plot. And John Bozeman, as my colleague Marcia Fulton likes to say, wrote in stone that he was killed by Blackfeet Indians. So, you know, depending on which theory you but you Nelson's believe, story is the one who wrote it, wrote it. And it so now so, William yeah. Mackenzie died many years later, maybe as as late as nineteen hundred and I think something. Nineteen sixteen, nineteen yeah. eighteen, somewhere in there. And but he requested, and Nelson Hutt's story had said, yes, he could be buried next to his good friend John Bozeman, who had died back in eighteen sixty seven. And so that friendship had had lasted and meant so much to him. So there's another face mm -hmm. of that that then talks about William Mackenzie. And so he's buried yeah. right there next to his friend. And at some point these artifacts must have then been given to story or somebody else who then donated them to the precursor of Museum of the Rockies. They were actually given to uh, a gentleman who was the executor of Bozeman's estate. Oh, and that's right. We don't know the name, but it might be in in Merrill Burlingame. It's in Burlingame's yeah. book. Okay. Sure. Okay. We should. And what ha too. and what happened there was the. Uh, this book. Oops. Oops. Yeah. Geez. This is. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Right. Right. Yeah. Book. And this yeah. is something we um. There's not a lot of these around, and I think it was it might be available online through JSTOR, but this has a lot of wonderful historical information that is referencing um, uh, primary sources, but uh, in talking with Michael Fox and Crystal just before we started this, there's a lot more new information that's come to light. So I think the idea would be to maybe amend this. Um, we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at Michael Fox to write up a new biography. Absolutely. So. We're looking at that. And <laughs> Burlingame's work is superb. superb. Yeah. Yes. And really anything that I would be doing would be amending and kind of adding to his work. But um, we could get better pictures. Yes. Uh, yes. We could do a better job in, in publishing something like this. And people especially Crystal, and others have been asking for years that we republish this. And um, yes, the time is right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, it's all important. But one of the things that is in the book is the story about how the estate was handled. And these items were part of that estate. Okay. And the guy who uh, did the estate did an extremely poor job. Oh, the executor was not very good. Was not, not very good. Right. And eventually what happened is the uh, a different executor was appointed to do it. But the first executor had these items and took them with him when he moved to Denver. Oh, wow. Oh, so they ended up in Denver. They ended up in Denver. And in the early 19 teens, his daughter, who was a very prominent uh Democratic Party um, partisan for uh, getting the women's vote in oh, Denver. Okay. She was actually a, a newspaper editor down there for a oh, while. Wow. Um, she sent these items to Montana State University and said, I think these things should be here. Wow. That's Yay. That's the MS one woman in the story. <laughs> yeah, our hero does the right <laughs> thing. Right. Okay. We okay. would not have these items <laughs> if it was not for her generosity. At MSU, they put these in a safe um, at, you know, in Montana Hall, and they stayed there okay. until... Museum of the Rockies was was founded. It was established, yeah. And okay. It, yes. It, so it wasn't until that time that these items came to us. Wow, that's amazing. So Very we have story. we have one more. We have the letter. Maybe you could just oh, show the, yes. the, the, sure. the the letter real quick. Okay. And um, that's like super exciting. Yeah, I think that this you know, and this kind of goes back to that idea that. You know, John Bozeman was writing letters back to his mother quite frequently. And so we have some, um, I think the Gallatin History Museum has some letters as well as the Museum of the Rockies. And so in this Burlingame book, there are copies of some of the letters or some transcriptions of the letters, but we have one right here um, in an actual letter, which is amazing. This is crazy. This is crazy. Uh, right like goosebumps everywhere yeah. and and the thing everywhere. is it's again not only these things have have he's touched right yeah. and they were found with his body last things that were found with his body but to have a piece of paper to see his handwriting 
what he chose to say, how he chose to use language. I mean, so we know this this man was educated well enough. He has nice handwriting. He did misspell quite a few things. Okay, right? yeah. okay. Well, most people, but, but, most people yeah, did back yeah, then. You know, that wasn't his job. <laughs> grammar, one oh. honest thing. But um, but here, tell us who this letter is to, Michael. This is from John Bozeman to his mother. It is dated, uh, I believe it is September 4th, 1866. So a year before his death. Oh, wow. And um, yes, much of what he is talking about here, day-to-day -day life in Bozeman, new people coming to town. But one of the things that he mentions in one of these letters, and I believe it is this one, is uh, how his mother should talk to his current wife about uh, his long absence here. And it's in this letter that he states that uh, he's not coming back mm -hmm. and that he is essentially abandoning his wife and three daughters. And, and he wants his mother to deliver that he wants, news. Yes, he's not writing this letter to his wife. Wow. He wants his mother mm. to deliver this news, tell her that he's not coming home and that she's basically on her own. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So what was that conversation? Oh my God. And how is she surviving? You know, does she have family? Yeah. Um, I would say after another quick peek at this letter, let's take a look at a photo that shows the three daughters yeah. as they're grown. Look at this. What does this say? Can we read this? Yeah. P.S. I will something you a piece of, of China money as it will be oh, uh, um, in that will be uh in that country or something uh -huh. it will be something a commodity a curiosity curiosity in that country in that country um right so maybe they don't have that and something purple in this country, country from, from all, all parts. Parts. there are people oh in there are this, people in this, this country, country and that's so true we know from early census from that you had parts of the world. a lot of people yeah. from china people from all over yeah. um and he lived right down where um the chinese community lived in bozeman his cabin was right there next to the 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 Chinese community. So wow. of course he had some money from the Chinese. Yeah, that's very cool. All right, Ashley, let's go to the the historic photograph that shows John Bozeman's daughters sitting in a family photo. I think it's all the way back. So there this we is are. a photo that is in the collection of the Gallatin History Museum here in Bozeman. And they generously let us show this today. And um, this shows his daughters, and you can see the three, the three women, the three kind of elder, older women who are sitting on the right side of the photo, and those are the three daughters of John Bozeman's. And the family resemblance is amazing to me. Like the daughter on the far left, she, her face looks very much like John Bozeman's face to me, and and all three daughters have a resemblance. And so they, I mean, we don't see either of their parents in this photo. We know John Bozeman's father's dead. We don't know what happened to his mother. We're not sure how old we don't know what year they this are is. here, yeah. but they've grown up. It looks like they yeah. have families of their own, yeah. um, the folks that they've married and probably children that they've had. So somehow, you know, they went on. Maybe she remarried. I would love to get on Ancestry and dig into John Bozeman's wife's story and yeah. learn a little bit more about that. Yeah. So interesting. But the yeah. family still comes to Bozeman um, today. I mean, you know, um, to and, and they will come and they will come to the Gallatin History Museum and they'll say, we're we're members of the John Bozeman family. We're descended from him in this way. And so, and they, um, they come, they come, from all over the world, really, from they all do. over. And they probably maybe come here. They absolutely yeah. come here. They want to see these objects. And we are overjoyed every time we oh, have a Bozeman descended here. And we are more than happy to pull these items out. Um, it's an important part of their family history and really fascinating, especially for people who are not from around here and they don't know that much about the story. Um, it's terrific for them they come here with their kids and say oh you know your great 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 grandfather these were his things he wasn't so great but he did get a town named after him <laughs> well and i'll let the jury stay out yeah, on that yeah. but um but this has been such an absolutely wonderful podcast and so fun to be able to do it as a sort of a video cast to a youtube uh presentation um but we probably should wind down our conversation so 
as we always do, I want to bring the topic to the present. So I'm going to ask you, you both, um, to think about and and just muse on for a moment what the takeaway is from our conversation today about the importance of understanding John Bozeman and his legacy. So, Michael, I'll start with you, and then Crystal, I'll ask you too. Well, one of the things that this conversation really brings forth for me is uh, kind of the importance that I think the public has. Uh, connected with John Bozeman's death and the mystery surrounding that. Right. And in a way that I feel like that uh, kind of uh, unfairly uh, overshadows how amazing his life was. The guy came from a gold mining community in Georgia, brought that information and that experience to the West, to Colorado, to Montana, and that he you know, was a second generation miner. His father had basically done the same thing, abandoned his family, the same way John Bozeman, you know, would, uh, would do that. And, uh, you know, big adventurer, big promoter, um, wrote the law. He uh, basically dismissed what the United States Army was doing there. And this is a classic, you know, early colonizer technique. Yeah, we know there's a treaty here. We're going to ignore that. So he really kind of hits a lot of the high spots of um, what, you know, what uh, early um, immigrants out here were like, kind of what their ideas were. What did they bring from? What did they bring and what did they leave behind, too? Exactly. Left behind wife and kids during the Civil War. Super fascinating. Yeah. So, Crystal, talk about John Bozeman's legacy and how you think it's it's relevant today or how should we think about it today? Mm. Well, you know, Michael summed it up really well, but I think that uh, John Bozeman was really in marketing. He was marketing this town of Bozeman. He was a promoter for the West. And he is very much like people are today here marketing this place we now call the West. And um, there's a lot of mythology that's wrapped around this. There's a lot of myth and there's a lot of realities that we don't look at. And so I think that when thinking about John Bozeman, we have to, as a legend, we have to kind of um, dig a little bit deeper, which I hope we did today a little bit, and kind of just talk about the man that he was. He was very much a man. He was a, very much a young man. He died when he was only 32 years old. And so I think we under, need to understand him better as just a man who was trying to make a living um, maybe not always doing that as ethically as he could with his family and with the indigenous people who were living on this land. And and the things that he did, everyone else was doing, and it wasn't um it wasn't the way to that it should have been done. So I think we just need to look at it a little bit more um closely and understand that, like we always like to say, history isn't pretty. And this Absolutely. case is exactly that. And one thing I just want to say to conclude is I think your point, Michael, about his death being such a, a major factor, I think the the takeaway for me is realizing that within a few months after his death, so August, right after he died in April, that's when we see Fort Ellis established right outside of Bozeman and Nelson's story and all these other town fathers and everybody who could grow meat and grain and sell it on contract, which is what he was out speculating for. That was huge business to supply a U.S. fort and military. So it was his death the outcry of danger from Indians, John Bozeman has been killed, that really won them the right to have the, the safety of a legitimate fort built and led to eventually rewriting the Fort Laramie Treaty, cessation of lands, and all of the Indians um, put on much smaller reservations and ceding all of that territory. So really his death precipitated absolutely major change that led to the growth of Bozeman and, and shrinking of all the, the tribal territories and economic possibilities for them. And Those you could you could actually say that uh, yeah. John Bozeman's death was one of the one of his greatest promotions because they once you have a significant permanent military fort in your town, you've got it made. Exactly. And all of these people who uh, were Bozeman's contemporaries, the people who founded this town, they made a lot of money selling uh, goods to the army, which again 
That's what Bozeman and Cooper were going to do at Fort Smith when he was killed. So the list of suspects grows. Right. So we'll just leave you with that. Okay, think about that. Yeah. So um, thank you, Michael. Thank you to yeah, all our listeners you. and our viewers um, out there for joining us today. If you love this podcast and or videocast, please tell a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up in your feed each week and leave a review if you can on YouTube or on um, podcasts for Apple or Spotify. Thanks for listening today. And we hope you can join us again to find out more about the, the dirt, dirt on, on the, the past. past. And we'd also like to thank Ashley for helping us out today. Yay, Ashley. Today. She's our technology guru. Here she Here comes she in. Comes. Come Yay. There, there she is. Yeah. I know. It's always on the opposite side you think you're going to yeah. be on. I know. <laughs> so thank you so much, Ashley. And thanks to the Museum of the Rockies for letting us record in your beautiful space. Thank you to our editors, um, Emily Alegria, Drake Pinnell, and Sierra Thomas. Thanks to Lawson Alegria for making the music, mixing the music, and to Steve Durbin at KGVM, and John Chadwell for help getting the podcast and now this video cast out into the world. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.